You know, uh, our usual talks are, so does everyone hear me? Do I need to turn something on? Everything? Okay, so, you know, our usual talks are 15 minutes, but research shows that the attention span is about 17 minutes. So, so, you'll, so I decided to give three 17 minute talks, and this is the first one. So, we have all our 17 minutes. What? We may not be concentrated at the same moment. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the first uh, example is of uh, a certain type of random walks with memory that I mentioned in the open problem session yesterday. These are uh, rotor walks, and this is uh, some joint work with Laura Floresco and Lionel Levine. Uh, most, there are fascinating hard questions and uh, cute, easy theorems. So the theorem, everything we can prove is, is quite easy, so it's published in, uh, in the Mathematical Monthly, but if you solve the problems, you will publish them in probably a more serious journal. So, so again, we're talking about rotor walk, which is a deterministic analog of random walk, uh, first proposed uh, by uh, Prizhev, Dar, Dar, Krishnamurthy, under a different name, and this name was given by Jim Prop in 2003. So again, every site in the lattice has an arrow. Um, we will start each arrow in a random direction. Uh, and every step when a particle is at the site, it first rotates the arrow by 90 degrees counterclockwise, and then it moves, the particle moves in that direction. So successive exits from a site will cycle through well, they could start anywhere, and then they cycle through this northeast southwest sequence. And um, <laughs> so in this context, we define an excursion of the particle. Not, so it starts at the origin. An excursion is not one return, but by definition, is, and it starts at the origin, and it has to uh, exit along all four edges, so, and, then, and then come back. So, um, it's really the fourth return uh, to the origin. So that's one excursion, and this is after 18 excursions what the visited set looks like, and this is after 54 excursions. I think, is Ed here? Yeah, so Ed actually has a, uh, a nice movie showing this. I'm just showing you uh, still pictures. So one basic question is, at time t, how many distinct sites have been visited? Uh, so for perspective, recall that uh, random walks visits up to constant t over log t uh, sites in t steps when we're walking in two dimensions. So here is a picture uh, trying to capture different excursion numbers with different colors. So one striking aspect of this model is that each excursion contains all the previous excursions. So it's very different from random walk where excursions have some independence. Here, each excursion will cover the previous excursion and will also cover the boundary of the previous excursion. So this walk has some nice combinatorial properties. So if <coughs> AN is the set of sites visited in the nth excursion and TN is the total time uh, of all the first uh, and excursions, then in excursion n plus one, every site is visited at most four times, but the sites in, the, in a n in the previous, that were covered by the previous excursion, are all visited, and also each of them is visited four times. The boundary of a n is also, is also visited. So, um, so just to say the combinatorial key to this is that if, <coughs> um, if every vertex that has a path pointing to the origin will be visited four times. In an, so if when we start an excursion, 
a site has a path to the origin, a directed path, then that site will be visited four times. So this you can check by induction along the path. At the end of an excursion, the structure you have is a spanning tree of, of the vertices visited at the excursion, is a spanning tree directed towards the origin. And hence, everything in that spanning tree is going to be visited in the next excursion. So, and if you want to see more details, it's in the, uh, in the monthly and the, also on the archive. So, so in excursion n plus 1, we said a n plus 1 contains a n union, the boundary of a n. So again, the, what I'm indicating to you here is a proof of the easy lower bound. It says that at time t, we're going to look at times t, which are the ends of excursions. This, the set covered has a cardinality at least t to the 2 thirds. So this is a 2 thirds, but no relation to kpz. Uh, the conjecture is that when you have random configuration, this 2 thirds is sharp. And uh, simulations show the constant is very close to 6 in that case. But, uh, we have, but for random initial rotors, we have no proof that it's little o of t. So, uh, so we're very far from proving a t to the 2 thirds. Um, the lower bound, which I'm indicating to you now, is very easy, although as far as we know, no one has written it down before our monthly paper. And it's, uh, but the, all the arguments are kind of, uh, classical combinatorial arguments. In particular, it's one sign that it's easy, it applies to any initial rotor configuration. Uh, so, uh, the, the, but some initial rotor configurations will be transient. So some will actually give a, a range of order t. So this t to the 2 thirds lower bound always applies. Conjecture to be sharp in the random case, but it's definitely not sharp in the general case. OK, so, so the, the, this general proof I already started. So an plus 1 contains an union with the external vertex boundary of an. So this means that the size that an will contain an L1 ball of radius n around the origin, so its size will be bigger than 2n squared. Now, tn, the total time in the first n excursions, is going to be at most 4n an, because every site in, in an is visited at most four times. Again, let me say why this combinatorial. So in every excursion visits every site at most four times, because if you, so look at the first, look at one excursion, like the first excursion. Suppose some site is visited five times. OK, let's look at the first site to be visited five times. That, so here's a vertex that's visited five times. So it means one of its neighbors must have provided a particle more than once. Because, right, so one of the incoming edges must have been used more than once. But if a, one of my neighbors has provided a particle twice, it means that one must have been visited already, uh, you know, five times. So you just, uh, so the first one has to be the origin where it all started. Okay, so, so that's why every site in, one, in an excursion, every site is visited at most four times. And uh, so the total time is at most uh, the size of an, because an contains all the previous excursions, times 4n, because every site in an is visited at most four n times in these n excursions. So, so tn is at most four n an. And now four n is at most root of eight an. You see that from here. OK, so it means we got tn is bounded by two an to the three halves. So an is at least tn to the two thirds. OK, so. This, this is just combinatorics. This is just combinatorics. So is it obvious that a plus one contains a n? Uh, not completely obvious, but yes, it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, the reason is, look at the, suppose you have a neighbor of the origin with an edge. Suppose we start 
with the, and some neighbor of the origin has an edge pointing towards the origin. Okay, so <coughs> um, <coughs> so I claim that in an excursion, that vertex has that that neighbor has to be visited four times. So. Um, So, so once you verify that, you can, by induction, conclude that anything with a path pointing to the origin will be visited four times in an excursion. And, um, and at the end of the previous excursion, all the nodes in AN have paths leading towards the origin. So the edges here, when a rotor, when a particle leaves a vertex, the rotor is in the direction that the particle left. So at the end of the excursion, we have a structure. The rotors create a spanning tree pointing to the origin. So, okay, there's some uh, thing to think about, but it, um, it just follows from the fact that in the previous excursion, uh, all nodes in AN have paths leading to the origin. Okay, so this is the, the two thirds, and it's, as I said, open to understand a, any kind of converse under an assumption of random initial rotors. So we can't do that. Let me tell you quickly about some other cases that uh, we, can, we can analyze. So one example is the Cobb graph. This is a, a one of uh, my favorite graphs, and it's not only, and I think a few other people. So, um, so this is just a subgraph of Z2 with the one horizontal line and all the vertical lines, but that's it. So in this comb graph, uh, this is how the structure of the uh, visited set looks like. <laughs> now. Remember, in Z2, we conjectured that the, <laughs> the conjecture, actually, by Prigev et al., is that the set of the range of the rotor grows much slower than for random walk, so t to the two-thirds as opposed to t over log t. On the comb, it's provably the other way. So the range in <laughs> the range of the walk is is only growing like, like root t. So the range is growing very slowly for a, like root t log t. But this is a classic example where there were previous physics paper. So, so this is proved with exact calculation by Pach, Pach and Tardos. But uh, there was earlier a physics paper claiming uh, t to the three quarter growth for the range. So, but yes. vertical, you switch this way and that way. Oh. So, okay. So first, up here, I'm talking about the range of random walk, oh. is root t log t. Now, the range up here, I'm talking about the range of the rotor walk. So, the rotor is indeed switching. So, at every site, it switches between the two possibilities. So, is the shape here true parallel parallel now? Yes. Yes. So here everything can be analyzed. No, no curves. No. Okay. And uh, so this is really because the comb is is a tree. You know, you can get through this with one-dimensional analysis. So first, you observe that on the x-axis it behaves like a rotor walk on Z, which will walk up to some point x1, then turn around and walk up to point x minus one, and so on. And um, <laughs> and uh, you can determine these locations as some sum of sums of geometrics, and using and you have a similar analysis on each line. So it's easy to analyze random walk in one dimension, uh, rotor walk in one dimension, and uh, you can build on that to analyze it on the comb. And the conclusion is that uh, <laughs> after you have uh, the rotor walk the range after t particles is going to be essentially a diamond of, a, of size n. So, t, so the relation between t and n is 
is this one, so t is some constant n cubed. And the conclusion is that with this relation between t and n, the diamond that the, the diamond that captures our t, the, so we have diamonds above and below, and they're both of volume uh, 2n squared. So these diamonds are just L1 balls. So because t has order n cubed and the diamond has area 2n squared, then uh, you get this two-thirds relation. So it's the same relation that's conjectured for the plane is proved for the um, is proved on the comb, but you know the shape looks different. So one conjecture of Prigia et al is that the shape in the plane is a ball. Uh, this is a not at all clear from the simulations that it's a ball. Uh, but you know, the, the longer the simulations they make, the, it looks a little more like a ball, but it never is very convincing. Here are two more cases that can be analyzed. So these are some directed lattices. Um, this is the Manhattan lattice that I'll, so where you have the one-way streets alternating in direction, uh, right? So, and, and this is a, another variant called the F lattice. And um, again, so, the, so here you see this, this vertex has a, two edges going out. The one on its left has two horizontal edges going in and so on. So, so the odd and even vertices have different directions of the incoming and outgoing edges. Every node has exactly two edges going in and two edges uh, going out, uh, but then they alternate between being vertical and horizontal. So that's on the F lattice. In both of these cases, we can show that the rotor walk is recurrent. And I remind you, that's an open problem for Z2. So in Z2, the range appears to be t to the 2 thirds. It appears to be very recurrent. So there are lots of excursions. But we can't prove it. So we can't prove, in particular, the range is little o of t. On both of these, we can prove recurrence, but the, the behavior, so the proofs are almost identical for these two cases. The behavior of the actual model seems very different in the two cases. I mean, is very different. This is the range of the, of the rotor walk on the Manhattan lattice uh, after two and 11 excursions. So you see this, uh, this kind of blob growing. This is the behavior on the F lattice. Uh, and it seems to, uh, so it is recurrent, but the growth uh, seems to be linear. So there's no, the growth could be linear together with recurrence. Uh, so, well, yes. The lattice is only referring to the initial condition. No, the lattices, no, no, no. The lattices are referring to the underlying graph. The initial, con so, Every node, so thanks for, I should explain this more clearly. So every, so this is the full graph. Instead of working on Z2, we're working on this graph, okay? And if, if a vertex has two outgoing edges, then the rotor walk, initial condition will just choose uniformly among these, and then it will just alternate between these two. Okay. So, the, so look at these two pictures, very different, but in both cases, we can prove recurrence by connecting it to the stochastic pinball or a percolate mirror model. <laughs> so you place at each vertex a mirror with 45 degrees. And <laughs> so in the classical mirror model, these mirrors are fixed forever. Here, the mirrors are only reflecting the initial condition, and they will uh, turn around. Um, <clears throat> so a mirror tells you when a particle arrives somewhere, where to go next, right? And so the, the rotors also tell you when a particle will arrive, where to go next. So given a configuration of rotors, you can erect mirrors that will behave like those rotors. But because the rotors are moving, the mirrors are supposed to move in the future too. 
but it turns out the initial configuration of the mirrors is very important. So, in this case, when you, in both of these lattices, if you build the mirrors, you can easily check that on some uh, dual lattice you get a critical percolation. So, we know that there will be um, contours of mirrors that surround the origin, infinitely many contours of mirrors. And then, what, using the combinatorics of the rotor model, what you can check is inside any uh, such uh, any such cycle of any such contour of mirrors, the particle will complete an excursion before breaking out of the contour. Okay, so that's again a combinatorial lemma. Um, so so that ensures at least one return to the origin for each contour surrounding the origin. So you get recurrence, but these contours are so rare that you don't get any good bounds for the range. So we cannot prove in this case that the range is sublinear, and indeed it seems to be sublinear in the Manhattan lattice, but not in the F lattice. But we can prove recurrence in both cases. So with time, new, new contours appear, but, uh, but then um, the problem is, are they capturing the particle? So a contour that is created and the particle has already escaped, you know, it's not so relevant. But so certainly the contours that are present in the initial configuration, all of those have to be broken. And for each one, we get uh, at least four returns to the origin. So, but exactly the difference between how contours are created in the future, that is different in these two lattices. So one challenge is to, these two lattices are much easier to analyze than Z2, but even then, their understanding the growth of the range is still not done. But not many people have thought about it. Okay, so this uh, tells you the story of the contours, and I'm ending this part by mentioning a few open problems. So again, one problem is in two dimensions recurrence, in higher dimensions transience. Again, take a million dimensions, proves transience, how hard could it be, right? So <clears throat> we haven't done it. Um, again, Suppose in Z2 you assume recurrence, and now you can use the structure of Z2. Can you use that to prove any upper bound like little o of t? We don't know that one either. Um, there's a lot of other lattices and fractal constructions where maybe one can analyze uh, the range of the rotor walk. And is the shape in 2D actually a asymptotic shape actually a ball or not? Uh, this we don't know. Okay, so that's the end of the first part. It was a little longer, so I'll have to <laughs> <laughs> uh, balance. And uh, the second part, you see it's very dense. Uh, <laughs> this comes from a question of uh, Benjamini, Cosma, and Shapira, um, who asked the following. So, again, uh, Maybe I should, uh, okay. So you have a random walk in, say, in three dimensions. <clears throat> but the random walk uses two different measures. Where is the chalk? So we have two different measures, mu1 and mu2. Say one of them is like this, and maybe the other one is like that. So you have two measures, mu1 and mu2, that describe possible jumps. All we are assuming on these measures is that they have bounded range and uh, mean zero, and they are fully three-dimensional. So unlike this picture, right, so we need some more arrows. So again, we are, we are in Z3 or Zd for d greater or equal 3. 
And these measures, mu1, mu2, are fully d-dimensional measures, meaning they're not supported on a hyperplane. Okay? So we have these measures, mu1 and mu2. And the question in the BKS paper is, suppose that on a first visit to a site, you use the measure mu1 for your jumps, and on all subsequent visits to a site, you use the measure mu2. Okay, is this clear again? We're walking in ZD, D is at least three, and we walk around. If we reach a vertex at the first time, we use the jump distribution mu1. If we are at a later visit, we use the jump distribution mu2. Now, each of these measures by itself, mu1 and mu2, yield a transient walk. Okay, if we are just walking with mu1, it's you know, very classical that this will be transient. The question is, this kind of combination, which is a random walk with memory, is, the, is this, could this be recurrent? So, and they also suggested the more general question, where suppose that the mechanism to decide between mu1 and mu2 is a more general adapted mechanism, not just according to the number of visits, but any rule that only depends on the past. Can you find a rule that will make it recurrent? And the answer, <coughs> the answer which is in uh, joint work that was published a couple of years ago uh, with uh, Popov and, uh, and with Perla Susi, the answer is that with two measures, there is no way to make it recurrent. It's always transient with two measures. Again, when the measures are fully d-dimensional, mean zero, bounded range, it's always transient no matter what adapted rule you choose to use them. But this is false if you have three measures. So with three measures in three dimensions, you can make it recurrent. And, and the example is mentioned here. So say you're in Z3, you make a step in, so you look at your three coordinates, and if uh, you take the, in the coordinate which is largest in absolute value, you walk plus minus one with high probability, one minus two epsilon, and in the other two coordinates, in each one you walk with small probability epsilon. Then for small enough epsilon, this walk will be recurrent in, in three dimensions. Um, so that's again proved in this paper, which is, you can find on the archive or in the Brazilian Journal of Math. And one open question is, uh, what is this? Sh so there is going to be a phase transition in this epsilon. What, where is the phase transition? It should be at a quarter. So my conjecture is that uh, for, for epsilon less than a quarter, this will be recurrent. We do know to show that for epsilon strictly bigger than a quarter, it's transient. So, um, okay. So. So the key to the proof for two measures comes from a calculation with the Lyapunov functions. So take a function which is x to the minus two alpha, where alpha is uh, tiny. Okay, and then a Taylor, do a Taylor expansion of this ratio and take expectation. So z is one step of the walk. Okay, and when you do this, you get this expression. So let me explain what's going on here. So M is the covariance matrix for the walk. So M, the matrix M is the expectation of Z transpose. So it's the covariance matrix of the walk. And uh, if you look at this, and lambda I are the eigenvalues of this matrix, and trace of M, well, it's the trace of this matrix, which is also the overall variance of the walk. So the sum of the variances of all the coordinates. So when you do the Taylor expansion, uh, you get that the ratio, is, so we look at the ratio of phi before and after the move, take expectation, and uh, what we get, so there's some error which is negligible, and this whole expression is, turns out to be quadratic, because you have xi squared here and x to the fourth here, and if the trace of m is bigger than twice the largest eigenvalue, then this expression will be strictly negative. Okay, so what, what it means is under this assumption, this uh, Lapunov function will yield a super martingale. 
right? So it's not, the expectation is going down. And so, and uh, this forces, this forces transients, right? Because suppose you start far out, you cannot, uh, so, so phi is small, you cannot go back to near the origin where phi is large, except with a very small probability. So you get um, transients from the usual Foster criterion or just a super martingale convergence. Okay, so this happens if trace of M is bigger than twice lambda max. And this is just one way to analyze a standard random walk. So if you have a standard random walk, the matrix has, has a covariance matrix, which is, I'm sorry, the walk has covariance matrix, which is the identity. So, so in dimension three and higher, the trace is indeed bigger than the eigenvalues, which is one. Okay, so if you want to analyze simple random walk, this is me. This is not hard, but it's not you know the simplest way, but it's pretty versatile. So now suppose you have. We know that for standard random walk, even if the covariance matrix doesn't satisfy the condition, it's still going to be transient. If we are using the same measure, then it's still transient. And one way to derive it from this is just to observe that for any covariance matrix M, so for any covariance matrix M, you could always find some other matrix A, so that A, M, A transpose, so this new covariance matrix will satisfy a, that the trace of M tilde will be indeed bigger than twice the maximum eigenvalue of M tilde. Just by diagonalizing M, you can easily do this. Now, what is this M tilde? M tilde is the covariance matrix of a new process, which is just obtained by applying the matrix A to, to the original process. So because A is invertible, you know, transients of x tilde is equivalent to transients of x. So this gives you one proof that for any random walk with any covariance matrix, which is not singular, you know, you get transients. But this proof is versatile enough to deal with two measures, because what we proved with uh, Popov and, uh, and per Perla is that for any two positive definite matrices that are three by three, you always can find a matrix A, a single matrix A, so that A, M, I, A tilde will satisfy the condition we want simultaneously with the two matrices. So this is some kind of joint spectral balancing. You have M1, you have M2. You can always find a single matrix A so that A, M1, A transpose, and A, M2, A transpose all satisfy the condition that the trace is bigger than twice the spectral radius. And once you know that, then the Lyapunov function criterion works for, the adapt, for this more general adapted walk. Because even though you're changing measures, the same Lyapunov function will give a super martingale that uh, goes to zero, and so you get transients. Any questions? So you can change it a few times, right? So, Arbitrary, so you can change arbitrarily as long as you change between the two, yeah, 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 yeah. The two matrices. And, but with three matrices, you can write down three matrices, you know, corresponding to the walk I told you before, where there is no choice of such A. One open problem is, is this condition about existence of A sharp? Okay, so we know more generally than, so I told you about two measures, but even if I have 15 measures, if I can find a matrix A that will balance them in this sense, all 15 measures, then I get transients for any adapted walk based on these measures. So the final thing I want to say about, again, st stop me if there are any questions because, yes. So if you're in four dimensions? Then yes. Three yes. Uh-huh. That's right. So in, the, in that paper, uh, we you know, use this argument to say, however many matrices you have, if you can jointly balance them, then you get transients. And we, uh, <clears throat> so we showed that 
if we are in D dimensions, you can build D measures that cannot be simultaneously balanced. That you can, by the same idea, you can get D measures that give a recurrent walk. And we conjecture that for any D minus one measures, they, will be, they can be jointly balanced. And that conjecture was proved uh, in a paper which uh, was uh, written uh, a couple last, last year. Uh, and so this is uh, the same uh, Ronen Eldan, the non-ergodic theorist uh, that was mentioned before, and uh, Nazarov and myself. We have uh, a paper that shows that uh, for any uh, d minus 1 measures in ZD, which are fully, OK, the same conditions, uh, mean 0, uh, fully d-dimensional, there is some A that will satisfy this condition simultaneously for all the covariance matrices. OK, so this uh, is appearing in the Israel Journal of Math. One remaining challenge is, can you find this A constructively? So for the 3 by 3 case, we give a recipe how to calculate the A. Uh, for the higher dimensional case, we give a rather complicated existence proof um, of, of the A that uses compactness and variational arguments. So we can't produce the A, but we do prove it exists. Questions? OK, third one. Yeah, yes. You said the other direction is open? The other direction is open, namely, uh, so in so a particular case which is open, good to focus on, is taking three dimensions uh, and take any epsilon less than a quarter, and you walk wherever you are, you walk with probability 1 minus 2 epsilon in the direction of the coordinate, the largest coordinate in absolute value, and with probability epsilon in each of the other coordinates. And the more general conjecture question, I can't say really it's a conjecture, but the more general question is, is this criterion sharp? Namely, if you cannot find such an A, does that imply that there is an adapted walk based on these measures which is recurrent? So this, this we don't know. In that case, that means what? In that case, adapt means that you've used the, the first one once, the second one. No, 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 adapt, no, 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 adapted means that the choice of which measure to use only depends on your history so far and not on some future thing. So adapted is the minimum requirement. But um, OK. Yes? If you have a stronger rule like that where it's uh, not depending on the trajectory, but just on your current location. Yeah. So I suspect that there's nothing better that you can, the, the, the extra power about using the history is imaginary. So, uh, so using where you are is the strongest thing. But even, you know, right. But so the converse, so a strong form of the conjecture would be if there is no matrix A, maybe then uh, you can always find just a, Markov chain where your next choice depends only on your current location, uh, which will give you recurrence. Choosing among the given measures. So, don't know that. Okay, so final topic is different, so it's not about random walks with memory, but rather an application of random walks to um, spanning forests. So, so first, let me remind you with a picture of uh, Wilson's algorithm, movie of Wilson's algorithm. So this is a way to create a spanning tree in a finite graph. You pick some root run a loop erased walk and from any starting node until it hits this root. Uh, so it might take a while. Uh, then 
Once you do that, start at a different node, run the loop race walk till it hits the current tree, and, uh, and keep going. Eventually, uh, eventually, you will fill up uh, the whole graph and get a spanning tree, which is, will be a uniform spanning tree. So this simulation is due to Bostock. Okay. Uh, so and uh, so I want to quickly report in my remaining 17 minutes of a uh, joint work with Tom Hutchcroft on the strange geometry of high dimensional spanning forests. But uh, I'll really just be able to tell you some of the history and the results. The paper is on the archive. Um, so again, here's a uniform spanning tree. Spanning tree, uniform spanning trees have amazing connections to many things. Um, and this is a partial list. Uh, the first, so we had to dig to find a picture of Robin P. Mantle from the time he proved this theorem. So, <laughs> in, all right, so, uh, so uniform spanning forest is obtained by taking a uniform spanning tree in a, in a finite subgraph and taking a limit as the, graph, as the subgraph goes to infinity again. So we have an infinite graph, say, you know, locally finite but arbitrary. Take an exhaustion by a sequence of finite subgraphs. In each one, you pick a uniform spanning tree and you pass to the limit. Um, if the initial graph is transient, which we will assume, then the spanning forest can be, okay, I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Um, actually, so you can do two constructions. So what I told you is called the free spanning forest. There's a construction of the wired spanning forest where outside the finite subgraph, you combine all the nodes to a single node you pick a uniform spanning tree in this wired graph, and then you pass to the limit. In general, these can give different limits, but in amenable graphs, and in particular in ZD, they give the same limit. We're gonna work now in ZD, so this limit is called the uniform spanning forest, wired or free, in this case it's the same, so just uniform spanning forest. Okay, now if a graph is transient, like, ZD for D at least three, then the wired uniform spanning force can be constructed by a version of Wilson's algorithm rooted at infinity. So what you do is you think of a root at infinity, you run a loop erased random walk, well, it's going to go to infinity, and then from any starting node, then you start at another node and keep going. And so I'll say more about this in a minute, so this is the wired uniform spanning, the free. Pimantel showed that in general, in any graph, both limits exist. As I said, in ZD, the two forests coincide and we call them the USF. So, <coughs> the USF, although it's a limit of trees, it need not be connected. And what Pimantel showed is it's connected if and only if the dimension is at most four. So if you're doing, working in ZD, up to four it's connected, and higher it's not. And this can be, so when Robin proved this, this was before Wilson's algorithm, so he had to work a little harder. He, had to, he used the aldous broder algorithm that existed before, but this is much simpler to verify if you know the Wilson algorithm. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so again, this uses loop erased walks that I assume people here know. So you run a random walk, erasing loops as you go. Loop erased walks were first analyzed by Lawler in the 80s. Um, okay, so for an infinite transient graph, as I said, you can mimic Wilson's algorithm. So you start with the empty forest. Now you create a the first forest is, you, the first part of the forest is just built by running one loop erased walk. Now you s start at another node and create a loop erased walk, but stop if you hit the existing forest. Okay? Now, 
in some graphs, what will happen is this second loop erased walk might not hit the first one at all. In that case, it's creating a new component, and these components can never be joined later. So once you have two separate components, you're assured to have two components at the end. So this easily yields one direction, namely, if your graph is like Z5, where two random walks started at faraway points are unlikely to intersect, then it follows that the uniform spanning force will be disconnected. So this way you easily get one direction of Robin's theorem in dimension five and higher, where an easy calculation shows random walks don't intersect. And of course, a random walk will also not hit a loop erased walk, so you'll get disconnected forest. The other direction requires knowing a little more. Uh, so in dimension at, at most four, what you need to know, in order to know that it's connected, you need to know that the, a random walk will hit a loop erased walk. So when, uh, luckily when Robin was considering this problem, this fact was already proved by Lawler a bit earlier in the 80s, so he could use, so Robin could use this in ZD and conclude that indeed, so this fact in three and four dimensions was proved by Lawler, and hence Robin could conclude that in dimensions three and four, uh, the, uh, the uniform spanning force is connected. He couldn't conclude it as easily as we're doing now because he didn't have Wilson algorithm, but still um, he could relate the force to random walk using the easier, the earlier algorithm of Aldous Broder and prove this fact. Okay, now this fact is easier um, because of Wilson algorithm as generalized in this paper to the infinite case. So, so again, after uh, Pimantel's work, there is a joint paper I wrote with Itai, Binyamini, Russ Lyons, and Oded Schramm, um, where we proved the following generalization. So if you take any graph, any infinite graph, the wire for uniform spanning force is connected if and only if two independent simple random walks on the graph intersect almost surely. So you don't have to analyze loop erased walks. It's enough to analyze random walks, and if, if they intersect, then the tree is, the uniform spanning force is a tree. So this is based on a, <coughs> on a inequality relate, so that says if two random walks intersect, then also a loop erased walk will intersect a random walk. So this is a general fact valid in any graph. So, okay, so let's go back since I'm, uh, the clock is running, let's go back to the structure of the forest. And I want to tell you about one more result with uh, Itai Binimini, Harry Keston, and Oded Schramm, which uh, looked at P. Mantel's theorem and said, look, in dimension five, Pimantel tells us there are infinitely many components. But it turns out that any two of these components are adjacent. So there are infinitely many components, but for any two, you can in fact find infinitely many points where they are adjacent. Okay, so that's, it was proved in, that, in this paper. And this is true in dimension five, six, seven, eight, but it fails in dimension nine. So in dimension nine, if you start at two faraway points and look at their components, with high probability these components are not adjacent. Okay? So there are lots of trees in the forest that do not touch. And this is true in any dimension higher, but until dimension 12 we have a substitute, namely for any two trees in dimension nine to 12, you can find an intermediary. There is some other tree which is adjacent to both. Okay, this is true up to dimension 12, but it breaks down in dimension 13. So in, but in dimension 13, you can find two intermediaries. 
And you get the picture. So there is a phase transition every four dimensions where you need one more intermediary. Another way to put it is to build some abstract graph where a node of this graph is, is a tree. And well, two trees are adjacent if they come within distance one in the lattice. And then what we're saying is that the diameter of this graph is a integer part of d minus one over four. So that's one way to summarize all these facts. Okay, Qu questions? So the statement is, is very nice and simple. The proofs involve um, an analysis of loop erased walks. And in this case, we found an elegant way to prove it using a definition of stochastic co-dimension or stochastic dimension of a relation in ZD and some inductive argument involving this notion. So this was the situation from 2004. Uh, one drawback of this uh, quite nice result is that it doesn't distinguish um, different dimensions if they differ by only one. Right? So we expect that dimension 9 and 10 should not be the same, but as far as this theorem goes, they are the same. So this was the question I addressed with, uh, with Tom. And um, it turns out to be much, it turned out to be much, much harder than I expected, but uh, also my, uh, my co-author was up to the task. And so uh, we can understand the structure um, and distinguish any dimension. And so any two dimensions, the graph, any two dimensions above nine and in some sense above four, but let's focus from nine on, the graph I told you changes every dimension. So this graph where the nodes are components of the forest um, really changes every dimension, although its diameter only changes every four dimensions. Uh, so, so, so here is an example. Suppose you take three trees, so three components in the forest. For dimension at most 10, we can always find the fourth tree that touches all three of them simultaneously, but this is false in dimension 11. So this is a property of the graph which is not captured by diameter, but it allows you to distinguish these dimensions. Um, you know, for four trees, we can find the fifth tree that touches all four if the dimension is at most nine, but not above. So this distinguishes dimensions nine and 10. Um, so, so as I said, the BKPS result can be phrased in terms of the diameter of the component graph of the forest being d minus one over four. And in higher dimensions, the key kind of question is what is phrased here in terms of uh, ubiquitous graphs. So, um, so we ask the very general question, given a, a picture like this, what does this picture mean? So these um, white, white circles are pinned components. So we pin, so for instance, in this example, we're asking for given four components, can you find a fifth one which is adjacent to all four? Um, you know, this asks a more complicated question. Given two pinned components, can you find this kind of structure of four other components that are adjacent this way and, are, and these two are adjacent to this one, these two are adjacent to this one? So any kind of finite graph you draw creates a question about subgraphs of the component graph. And by now we can answer for any such diagram, is it ubiquitous? Is it contained everywhere in the, in the uniform spanning forest in a given dimension or not? So, um, so I'm going to, so telling you the details of this is going to uh, need a different talk, but I just want to mention that some ideas coming from a much simpler problem, a very classical problem going back to Erdős Reni, who asked, you know, given some finite graph, am I going to see it inside GNP? So for that kind of question, 
you can always calculate the expected number of occurrences of a little graph inside GNP, but that doesn't always tell you the right answer because there might be a graph where in expectation it occurs often, but there is some subgraph which is an obstruction. Um, and so you have to look not just the expected number of occurrences of a graph, but also for all subgraphs. So some ideas from that erdos rheny theory are needed here, and they have to combine with all this theory of the Wilson algorithm and, uh, and a lot more. So finally, there is some a criterion that allows us to um, analyze the general case. Um, so I'm going to have to uh, skip this story, but, um, but tell you in the end there's a, there's a condition um, where you have, to, given a graph, you have to, um, it can be described by uh, connecting balloons to the nodes and weights to the edges and seeing if the graph lifts off. And uh, <laughs> so, but uh, I'll have to skip the details of this and just finish with a few, with these examples since I'm uh, out of time. So I told you that we can distinguish any dimension from nine on. But what about dimensions five, six, seven, eight? So in those dimensions, the graph of components is a complete graph. Any two components touch each other. So if you just look at the graph of components, there is no way to distinguish five, six, seven, eight. But Tom insisted on distinguishing those dimensions and uh, you know, with, where there's a will, there's a way. So for instance, in five dimensions, for every five trees in the USF, there is a ball of constant radius that intersects all five trees. So this is something that you cannot describe. This is a hypergraph property. It's not a graph property because five, six, seven, eight, you have a complete graph. There's nothing more to say about the graph. But this is a property that works in five dimensions but fails in dimension six and higher. Um, in six dimensions, every three trees, there is a ball of constant radius that intersects all three. This is not true uh, for more trees, and it fails also in dimension seven and higher. So this is a way to distinguish dimension six and seven. And the final picture, to separate dimension seven and eight, is, takes the most sweat. So, what, so in dimension seven, given six trees, so the white things are given six trees in the component. You can always find three other trees with, that correspond to this hypergraph. So what does this picture mean? These two, together with this one, come within a bounded radius. The same here, the same here. And these three, somewhere else, come within a bounded distance. So this you can always do in dimension seven and not in dimension eight. Thanks for your attention. Yes. For those, uh, the, the properties of those uh, forests in the various dimensions, is this just for square lattices, or would, could you do it for arbitrary? Same. Thank you. The, so one thing we prove is, a, you know, so there is a universality, namely all graphs of polynomial growth okay. are equivalent if they have the same growth. So if you are the Heisenberg group, okay, if you answer the, the, the follow-up question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well. okay. So.